I'm very happy to see, have a chance that we can all get together, um, get together virtually at the very least. Um, all the students who started the semester, I've heard lots of good things. I know there've been some difficulties and some bumps here and there, but from what I understand, all the classes have, have begun and, uh, and things are moving along. So good job. And, and if, if anyone has any trouble or any issues, please, you know, approach the office, get in touch with your supervisors. Uh, we'll, we'll find solutions and, and give you support for anything that you need. Um, those of you who are, who are connecting with us from outside of our department, we're really glad to have you. And please uh, send your, when you register, we'll have your email and we'll, and uh, Nico Waldman, who's the, the host of our seminar, our coordinator, he'll be sending you notices um, so that you can join us also uh, week to week um, for other speakers as well. And I want to thank Dr. Eichler for taking the time and, and presenting to us today. We're, we're really looking forward to it and um, I hope we'll have some some uh, lots of time at the end for questions so uh, speak to you at the end of the talk thank you thank you Beverly so um, um, we're very honored to host uh, in this weekly seminar Dr. Patricia Eichler um, Patricia is an international research scholar in science <laughs> and science publications author. She is a biological oceanographer, and her expertise is on the assessment of coastal and marine environments through the integration of marine bioindicators, especially for aminifera, with physical and chemical data sets, which as a dedicated ecologist has led or her also to co-found Ecologic Project. Recently, she has been focusing on the use of stable isotopes for micropaleontology studies for calibration of the past and how these predict predictable indicators for ocean acidification and climate change affect future sea levels rise, environmental, social, and economic loss. She is a researcher at the Geodynamic and Geophysical Laboratory at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte in Natal, in Brazil, and Federal University of Bahia. I think that these two are really beautiful places, Patricia. <laughs> Simultaneously, she works on several projects, such as a few of these uh, currently include sewage outflow, uh, how these affect the mangroves, coral reefs restoration, and conservation of a newly discovered coral reef area in Brazil. And of course, deep sea research as microplanetologist of the International Ocean Discovery Project, IODP, and the last 23 million years of the Western Pacific warm pool. So uh, we are very honored that uh, Dr. Eichler is going to talk about the environmental indicators unraveling climate change consequences. So the podium is yours. Um, uh, thank you uh, um, very much for the invitation, Nicholas Waldman. And it's my pleasure, my honor to be here. So at the University of Haifa, at the Department of Marine Ge Geoscience, the weekly seminar series, uh, to talk about environmental indicators uh, that unravel climate change consequences. So as Nicholas uh, told you guys, I am from the Ecologic Project, and I am the in the geologic. Um, the geology and geophysical, marine geophysical and environmental uh, lab at Natal and at the Bahia. And I'm funded by um, CMP Kids, our science based in Brazil, science um, council, and for our higher education personnel, CAPS, and also by the International Ocean uh, Discovery Program. So today I'm gonna uh, start this talking by talking about the, the IODP. Um, and here I, sh I show you guys this map where there's the, um, uh, all the cores that have been collected all over the region. And there is this gap over here that shows uh, there is nothing going on down there yet. So, uh, our uh, 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 expedition talked about 
especially this part where this warm of the ocean, the Pacific, it's very, very high. So this surface temperature can hit up to 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, and there is this interesting area of the coral reefs and also there is um, a link uh, on the International Ocean Discovery Program and the last 23 million years ago in the Western Pacific warm pool. Uh, so the, we call the, um, so here we, you can see some planktonics. And since we spend two months at the joint resolution uh, and collect samples, these are the scientific team. We saw many um, sunsets and sunrises and it's uh, interesting, um, the north of the Australia, it's a beautiful uh, scenario too. And it's important to put us on exactly uh, like the travel times, where is our project of the Western Pacific uh, uh, is located and it included the Neogen and the Quaternary. So this is uh, like I told you, the tw like the 23 uh, years, uh, million years ago. And we can see that's very small part of all the um, chronological, geological um, chart, right? So uh, talking about uh, a little bit of Western Pacific warm pool, where this part of uh, very warm waters are concentrated and what gets to, what, what, what is it, this is, important and why is this linked to the global context, to the global climate, right? So we need to talk about El Nino when we, we are talking about this part because this is a normal year where you have the cold water here along the South American coast and you have strong, um, trader winds that blow and makes the water um, pile up at this part and makes it uh, subject to the wind forces. So in an El Nino year, you can see that the eastern really like the trade winds are very weak. So um, you see that the concentration of warm water are this part and you have a kind of different um, dynamic. So here in the normal year, you have the trade winds blowing and you have the worker circulation. I'm talking about this a little bit of the cell of the circulation. And in El Nino, you have a, a other kind of formation because you have the weaken of the trade winds and you have this warm water up on this concentrate on this part. So a bit more about El Nino and what's the difference between the El Nino and La Nina, right? So El Nino, I already told you, is when the, there is a weaker trade winds. But the, El, the, El, the La Nina is just the normal conditions, like the strong, but the trade winds are stronger. So you actually have a different phenomenon but also makes a stronger up upwelling on this part. So here you have a thermal climb and here's upwelling. So by, 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 by looking at about this um, situation, like the, wa the waters, so we try to, uh, to see what like the convection and the um, dynamics imprint on the geological uh, record, right? So that's exactly what we did. We went to this, um, we left Singapore on October the 6th, 2016, and we did it at um, the 363 um, expedition, uh, and we, uh, we uh, ended up in Guam, on December the 8th. So it was two months 
um, on this joint resolution, which we could collect nine um, sites. And it's uh, a little bit more uh, a detail about the warm pool and where they actually came from. And it's a very important place to be able to actually be collecting samples because when you have this higher um, temperature, you actually will be able to see the, the patterns in a better way, like the ecology patterns in the way the organism um, responds. So here for you to, to see that the warming of the global is here now, because in 2016, we already see that the El Nino, this is a El Nino, um, oops, um, exposition. So you see that 1997, um, it has increased because in 2015, it has increased and spread it all over the coast of the US. And here is important to share some images because the climate change is about difference and the worst temperatures like floating, warm, and so you have like um, very dry uh, environment and you actually have very um, uh, floating time. And it takes a lot of burden and all the ecologic and also economic and social, um, um, all the environment. So we use fossils because this kind of uh, organisms, they yield clues about past climates. And why? So they are so important that New York Times said it. So they are easy to collect, not expensive. They are statistically great value. So you actually do biostatistic and you use numerical analysis, which I will show you. The shells are preserved after the bed. And the shells are preserved after their death. And the time average um, shows the record in the environmental conditions like temperature, salinity, um, organic carbon, oxygen. And you have uh, uh, also uh, different uh, the difference between the living and the total fauna. So working with the living fauna, you talk about the snapshot of the environmental conditions at that really that moment. And the total fauna, when you have the living and the dead ones, you have an average picture of the ecological in terms of annual or interannual variability. So the El Nino is an interannual variability. So we expect that it's pretty much easy for us to understand the situation. But how we do this? So there are a bunch of um, the um, species, the communities are working together and living together, thriving in the specific temperature, dissolved oxygen, nutrient input, input grain size, salinity, or that. So this kind of um, environment, they have this particular sedimentological and hydrographic properties. Remember I talked to you about the warm water? So the environment has this condition that affects the ecological aspects of the population dynamic. So we actually use the ecologic uh, to tell us. But before I can talk about the organism, I'm going to explain to you how we collect the deep ocean sampling how we did the sampling at the IODP. So many of you are familiar, but um, most of you maybe not. So um, this is the, the ship and this is a core that will, it takes like, it can get even 3000 meter deep and even 500 kilometer in the sediment. So, and this is, is bring to the ship, to the ship in pieces. 
and now we will illustrate that for you. So in each core, we have a um, core catcher, which all the work in the joint resolution are based on the core catchers. Uh, we actually open up the course and we describe it and I'm gonna show you all the results um, on the ship, but it's all based on the core catchers. And then I will, I will show you also when we went and collect the subsample every two centimeters, okay? So this is a kind of the platform that you, you, you have, um, that you look, and this is the, um, uh, the only ship has a hole in the middle and doesn't sink. So the hole is in the middle and it's here. And this is the, the visual of the deck, of the work deck. And here are the um, scientists we get together like to have, uh, you know, to stay two months at the ship. You got to do meals and um work very well with people because it's like 200 people in one space of 100 square meters, kind of, I don't know. But anyway, it's, in, it's a, a very indeed task and you have a 12 hour shift of working. It's um, interesting because you learn a lot. And, but here I'm, I'm showing you a visual of the core being taken out from the sediment floor. And here's this, um, um, some sampling, the way they come for us and they describe it, like all the, the sedimentological um, faces. So I'm gonna explain to you a little bit of the core catchers. So this is the micropaleontology group, which I belong at the, at the joint resolution. This is um, uh, our, Chief um, Paul Pearson, um, and he works with the um, planktonics and the nanofossils guys also. Um, and here I'm here with the core catcher, first one, and this is our friend from China. So we all interact in the lab, so washing samples. Um, and then once the um, we're washing samples and looking at the microscope and describing. It's a very dynamic uh, environment. So when we stop, we stay three to 10 days. It depends how deep we go. Um, and this is some illustration of the organism that we got um, deep down. This is an interesting one which um, shows some foraminifer attached to one organism. So it's one uh, benthic with a lot of planktonic attached to it. So a small vision. And it's interesting because they attach with the, uh, um, the same orientation. Uh, here's a view of the ship. And um, we have um, um, high resolution microscope. To, so we could identify the species at the time and know exactly what we were dealing with. And after we, we, we have uh, all the, the sampling, the um, sediment washing, this is a kind of view we have from the foraminifera. So it's, it's each of them is like this structure so that we researchers have to, to do at the ship. It's a, a work that it takes like maybe 400 samples, each organized. And we try to do our best because you gotta work with them. Uh, and as long as you leave it very well organized, it's easier for you. Here is just an um, illustration, how we study the climate through geologic time and we examine the cool temperature and warm water species preserved. So we look at the paleo temperatures and the paleo circulation. So they are able the from, uh, to give the age of rocks and also to interpret changes in sea level. So uh, 
by looking at all these properties and we wanted to to see then the sensitivity of foraminifera assemblies um, in the department environmental changes. So this is uh, the nine cores that we collected in this. This is the, the, first, the map I showed you and this is all the cores. So nine cores, so um, they, they range from a small size to very huge ones. So this one is 500, uh, 500 uh, meters down to the sediment and we reach to the, uh, to the Miocene. Yeah, so the bottom of the Miocene, uh, early Miocene. Um, uh, and here are the recent ones. And these are in there, all different um, in uh, each uh, environment. This is a kind of coral reef submerged, and this is a, a, a volcanic zone. And this is the, the very uh, old ones that we could sh sh uh, see some interesting changes at this early Miocene. Um, and here is um, a, a study that you do for each of the course that I showed you. So this one is an illustration of the very long one that we reached 24 million years ago. And to, to have the age model in two weeks, in two months, right? So actually this is, it's after a week of work. Uh, it has to be done in a several way that the multidisciplinary, uh, the 35 scientists on board has to work together. Otherwise it will not uh, achieve any success. So we have top datums of foraminifera and nanofossils that we actually shows us the age. And here is the illustration of the core itself and the way it was um, described. Uh, here we have all the epochs. And this is the illustration of the uh, occurrence and extinction of the species. So this, is, this age model is based on extinction and occurrence. So the environment, the organism, they are very much limited to this temperature and salinity and all the factors. So this is uh, um, uh, a picture of the International Ocean Discovery Program at the college station at uh, the university in Texas. And we went there to sampling the, it's, it's, a, it's a facility funded by NSF. And we went there to actually uh, uh, subsample our um, work in every, two, uh, every two centimeters. So imagine this is our course from Western Pacific Warm Pool. And we have to, <laughs> Um, should sample it every two centimeters. So it's a very hard work that we get together after the two months at, this, uh, at the Joy's resolution, collecting the samples. We go then to this facility and stay for three weeks to two weeks to subsampling, right? So everybody goes there and and we get our own course and we have our specifically um, necessity for each project. So it's, it's very detailed process and it's all um, deal with um, very precisely. And we have this technician, all the uh, team to work with us, the IODP team. And this is when the samples arrived at the university. I had my student to help me to carry uh, 
because we're, we're being looking at, so I will show you some results that are based on my research of today. But when we deal with this um, foraminifera, then, and we talk about numeric analysis, we look at the absolute density and the relative, and also at the different envi environmental variables. We do univariate analysis, diversity, dominance, and evenness, and we apply ecological index, uh, like the same group in 1996 and the oxygenation one. And there is also the coral reef from the Halop at, at all 2003. They're, they're, they're being established for years, so we can try, we can use and apply. And uh, one gives us the oxygenation, and the other one gives us like the health in the coral reefs. And when we deal with also the environmental variables, we just, just do this multivariate analysis on um, multidimensional scale or principal component analysis or best that shows which, which are the, which is the environmental variable it, which are going or influencing the community. So we, we're sure which are, and we can then um, be monitoring this variable. So, and also we, it's interesting to do contour maps with I use Surfer or Arc, just they show a lot and can illustrate the, um, our work. Um, so um, the environmental indicator of foraminifera, they are very important because they, they are, for example, depth sensitive and they identify uh, intervals of down slope transport. So we have um, uh, deep water species and we have shallow water species. So this is uh, forms which were found uh, under a 1,000 uh, meter deep and Coral reefs are not found there. So one of our first um, assumptions were that uh, there was uh, actually some landslide which have br brought this uh, reef species to a place who are not supposed to be living, you know? So, because they like the, to live close, close to the, to the light of the sun. So they cannot be found a thousand um, meter down. Um, so when we see this, we actually are able to investigate whether the changes in this relative abundance of warm benthic foraminifera provide a measure of climate. And then we relate it to bottom water changes. So Lutz in 1970, uh, 1977 and 2007, he discovered a warm benthic foraminifera curve that uses um, a group of warm water species and that belongs to more than 3.5 degrees Celsius. And he, he uses also the cool water species that is less than 2.9 uh, centigrade. So, and we, by ba based on this um, work, we uh, saw that our data correlates very well. And there was a very good correspondence between warm water species abundance from the youngest catchers, like we use the core toppers to, to um, link to the bottom water, uh, bottom water temperature. So this is the work done with, by Billups. There was Katarina Billups from the University of Delaware, from myself and from Elenice Vital. And that was from the West Pacific Warm Pool. And we also look at the Ubijabina prosbocidia that she thrives in this high nutrient condition. So she's a limited to low latitudes where carbon flux rate is high to the 
higher primary production. Uh, so oxygen levels, they will be very low. So by looking at that, we already have a link. So the presence of oxygen depleted in this Indonesian intermediate water and the North Indian intermediate water that is actually in the same place as ours, that we are work done with more geese and the data, they actually um, uh, correlated very well with our work and which I will show you. Um, so the changes in abundance of Uvigirina prosbocidia is an indicator of surface water productivity. And she has been used to reconstruct the evolution of the monsoon uh, and actually tackle the impact of the seasonality of primary productivity. And there is a positive correlation with the increases in UV gerina and the relative abundance of warm water species. So here is a, um, our, our nine sites. And this is the position, latitude and longitude, and the water depth that they, they range from. So they range for 800 meters to 3,400 meters. So that ship has um, autonomy to collect a tree in the water depth um, on the sediment of uh, 3,400 meters. And we have all the hydrographic temperature. So this is our work, as I already told you, that was, um, so it was published in now journal from NIFRA research. And this is a um, cluster analysis showing the, the two groups of the sites which have difference in temperature, differences in temperature. So it's very marked. And we, will, we, we can show you also that the linear correlation between this carbon flux and the bottom water temperature, right? Carbon flux and the bottom water temperature with the warm species. It's a very positive. And we also put our data together with the uh, Morghese and Decker, and it gives a very interesting approach, and it's in the paper. So this figure shows the correlation between the carbon flux and the Uvigirina, which shows also this um, positive correlation. So she actually is thriving where there is very high organic carbon. Um, this is a, 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 um, a figure illustrating the last 11 um, million years ago, which uh, we, there is the Pleistocene, Pliocene, and the late Miocene. Uh, and we can say, we can see that the warm species index works very well and, and they indicate that the core catches, the potentially affect, are affected by the sediment um, um, characteristics. So here there is also the temporal uh, variation in the warm species for two, for two other sites. So here I, I think, uh, yeah, I showed this for, 82 and 83, and here I'm, sh I'm showing for 1484 and 1485, so there are nine on core, so this is uh, also, we, we can see a very interesting correlation between warm species in the Papua New Guinea um, cores in the late Pleistocene and uh, middle uh, Pleistocene with Uvigerina prosbocidia in both. So we actually observe that this increase in this species follow increase in abundance of warm water species, particularly at, at the sites of the Papua New Guinea. Uh, the Papua New Guinea are the sites with the coral reefs. And so they indicate a very close relationship between the climate warm and the nutrient deliver via freshwater discard uh, through, of course, the septic river at this 
that, that uh, part. And here the Manus Basin. I show you two other sites, which also it uh, proves one more time that um, our um, species, Vigerium prosbocidia, uh, it's a very nice link to the worm species. So actually you have two proxies, two different proxies. You can use uh, two groups or actually one species. Um, it is, this is science because then first time you look at all the species, then you can, you were able to select some of them. And then uh, at the ultimatum, you are able to select one to show what you actually want. So we can see the warm species and that looks at, um, that um, correlates well with the warm water temperature. Um, and it's very significant. Uh, and here it's a compilate, a synthesis of the long term for four sites. And they all show that the Pleistocene maximum in warm species shows a, ten, uh, a general trend towards cool, colder conditions here. So, it's um, important uh, to, to note that we don't have um, direct measure of our uh, age. So we use the smooth magnetic foraminifer that uh, based on Lee Skin Rainbow from 2005 for all the sites, which I didn't mention in the beginning, but that's, that's what we use. Uh, so then what is actually the link between the ocean warming in the Western Pacific one book and, assist, and the six mass extinction, right? Um, it's important to explain that we uh, rely on the excellent preservation of our fossils. And they show a very uh, physical tolerance. For example, this Laticarina pauperata and other species also. Uh, they have um, show uh, important uh, uh, thing about the, the, the last uh, glacial and interglacial sites of the late Oligocene. So uh, the last 24 million years ago, we can also using one of these species which are on the warm species pool. Uh, it's important uh, to show, uh, because look how the thin uh, uh, test is. So she is, a, this is a frontal view, and this is a, um, a side view, and she's a compressed one. And that makes it easier for uh, her to actually tolerate the physical disturbance of the sediment, imagine like 500 um, meters of sediment uh, pressuring this species. And she even looks very fragile, but she actually is very strong, uh, very strong. And she shows her strength because we can see the um, patterns. So by looking at the warm and cool species, Right, uh, we can see this is the um, like a preliminary. I always say that there is a preliminary results because when you find something interesting, you gotta keep working. And all these nine sites that are illustrated here, they all have this um, linear curve of warm species that shows that we are going from a colder environment to a a uh, warm one, with just one exception of one um, of the sites, which um, I pretty much think that it is because of the volcanic eruptions. But I will talk about this one, the 85, because it's um, the first one who actually we look at the ashes. 
that we and Tefra that we found at the at the record and this uh, core is specifically show that there is warmer periods than today from the Miocene to recent and we are looking at specifically a warming towards the present and here I show you this linear this is the 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 warm organism this is the cool ones and here I um, I put closely a diversity um, map with five peaks right which I will explain to you in this next one um, we have uh, less than 0 0.07 million years ago le the last gl maximum glaciation which i we can see um a small depression our diversity we can see also in the early holocene we see in the late pleistocene and but i'm gonna talk about this my middle um this is younger than the middle pleistocene transition and we can detect we detect very strong sign of tephra and ashes in this um, course and they show at least these two decreases in benthic reversed after pleistocene volcanic eruptions so this at least five decreases that in diversities uh, in the past show that the response of the benthic community to adverse climate is a change in the ecological pattern. So these changes can take a whole community and an entire ecosystem to extinctions. And we have already seen five extinctions along Earth history. And actually, we, we could see it, some of our samples. And the question, are we going to face another one? Is perhaps a six max extinction coming? What about in our present time? Do you guys think we will make geological history? I will show you this before we get to the questions that you guys have for me. This is just the, the end of the, this is the, our nine course that I illustrated. That was the, our work by Rosenthal et al. that we finished at the ship 2017. And it shows a very interesting age, um, uh, model age, or the 24 uh, million years, with, which uh, shows the middle Miocene climate op optimum and uh, early Pliocene warm period. So this is exactly where we are. We cannot, or we can actually, Reveal that something is going to happen and it's happening. That is showing that we are going to an early Pliocene warm period soon. It, we can see it in our record and we can preview that. Um, and by saying that, I want to just point out that this is too um pictures of a uh, hurricane pathway this is tracks in modern climate we know that us has a very uh, high pathway and also this part where we have this evapotranspiration here for the um, where we have the warm pool and it's in interesting to note that here in brazil we, ha we don't have uh, a modern one, but it's important to note that in 2016, um, in 2004 we had one, we had in 2016 one, and we, have in, we had in 2022. And today as we speak, we have one coming down south from Antarctic. So, here is a Pliocene uh, cli climate tracks, and it shows all the pathways that we are going 
to face if we keep doing what we're doing at our forest and doing everything what we're doing. Here you can see the, um, the patterns, very dynamic, which will take uh, a lot on the socioeconomic patterns and biological communities. Um, and it's an interesting question. I think everybody will uh, be able to talk about that. But before we finish, I want to talk about the book that I wrote um, uh, with um, Christopher Paul Barker from the Ecologic Project and talks about the benthic from from ecology. And it's, it will show a lot of I, what I talked about today in my talk and also uh, my 30 years of work I've been developing. And it's due on December 29, 2020. It's a Springer Nature um, Life Sciences book. And it will address the monitoring and forecasting of local and global environmental impacts. And we will address ecological solutions for vulnerable coastal areas, right? Because you cannot always um, just point out what's happening. You gotta try to find solutions. So we actually are, sh you show some solution and it's a very accessible language even for the geology masters that you guys are and are not biologic majors, but it will um, make your life easier to understand about this beautiful universe that is for neuro ecology. And it's a variable to um, resource for decision makers. Uh, I'm gonna show a bit of the book. Um, there is an implication of the problems I show you and the ability of forecast patterns, right? Um, on land. And it will be the addressed by studying marine sediment. We study beaches, estuaries, bays, deep water, world, wild. So, uh, all the strategies that we need to inform the leadership, it's and the data is there. And this is an interesting uh, picture that I, I showed that the foraminifera are all uh, spread and can show about the sea level rise because uh, there is two uh, um, environment that actually are uh, below sea. Uh, below sea level, that's mangroves and coral reefs. And uh, we got a problem and we got a solution that's the benthic and the planktonic. The planktonic give us the ages of the age, model, the age models and this gives us the environment. So it's uh, a very, uh, was very honor for me and thank you very much. Um, obrigada. And this is a very, um, nice sunset of the, uh, Western Pacific one to a day of Australia, um, plateau. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Obrigada. Um, De nada. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, Please, uh, if somebody has a question, you can just um, pop in or write it in the chat. Or just, oh. just pop in and... Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Yeah, okay. go Thank ahead. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, um, in the early slides that you showed, during the drilling part of the collection of samples, so I can see that during the drilling parts, you allow the escape of the fluid with the other sediment to, to the ocean floor. So I'm not thinking, in that case, how would you prefer, uh, how would you preserve the fauna and the flora that you are looking for? One. And on the drilling bit, I can see that you use the drilling bit. I was thinking, wouldn't that drilling bit destroy the faunas or floras that you are, you are that you are looking for to for paleo um, climate reconstruction thank you you know you, you you can destroy you can destroy some of them 
But you say um, they are, um, the numbers are very, very high and you actually estimate numbers, you don't count it all. Uh, you actually uh, take, you, you take the error out when you estimate. But it's a very interesting question. But we actually do uh, the best we can to preserve and, and don't lose everything. Um, but by doing this method, by um, estimating, like for example, you get a sample and then you divide in like two and then you divide in four and then you look at one part and then you, you do a calculation, right? An analysis. It's easier to actually um, have a nice, a pretty good uh, understanding of the patterns. Thank okay. you. Somebody else wants to ask something? I I have a question, no, sort of please. a technical question. Um, uh, I'm I'm curious because I personally, you know, we we do a lot of uh, work out on ships, but generally we get to go home within a few days. We're rarely, <laughs> I mean, a few of us have gone on, on longer uh, on longer cruises, but uh, we we generally are are going offshore and maybe a week, you know, is sort of the the longest that our our cruises last um, locally anyway. And when you were showing the, the age model, um, do I, so can you say a little bit more? Because from what I understand it, you're collecting the core and you're sort of live in, in, in live action, taking the samples, getting those distributions, throwing the age model up on the graph, like in live time. Is this what I'm understanding? Yes, exactly. I, I did it. Yeah, I didn't put like the emotion on the thing, but it's exactly like that. I'm going to explain. They say, for example, core on deck, right? So you got you to gotta be ready because once the core comes, you don't stop anymore, right? It's a 12-hour shift. And like when we get the first, second sample, people are coming and they are actually having a board writing the species that we actually found like the planktonic and the nanofossils and they are like doing that like and it is a, a healthy competition because where you don't have the planktonic you have the nanofossils that is what i understood uh the planktonics are very well accurate but nanofossils are even more because they're smaller and more numerous so the thing is the plankton, the foraminiferous plankton, they found it first, for example. But when they cannot find, they will rely on the nanofossils. But when the planktonic find and the nanofossils find, they say, they meet, they meet. And so they, they're doing that. And then every 12 hours, you have a meeting and show what's going on. So everybody, like the 30 scientists, I'm, not, I'm exaggerating, but maybe five will come to us, the micropalaeontology um, laboratory, and want to know and want to see. And, and I, I was like, oh, it's interesting because I didn't know we were actually the most important part <laughs> of this whole ship. Of course right? you were, of course. Well, yeah, I, but... <laughs> I, I think it's, I mean, I think it's fascinating also um, the, the, the technical side because obviously, you know, we find even when we're, you know, when we go out on some of our cruises, whether or not we'll be able to tolerate looking through the microscope <laughs> depends on the conditions of that day. So I imagine you must have a really, really, really tough stomach <laughs> because, I mean, that's, that's really quite challenging because if, um, you know, depending on that day's conditions, it may or it may not be so easy. Interesting you said that because different from other ships, you don't feel that you okay. are the ocean. Yeah, it's got to be a big enough there. ship. Oh, yeah, because it's not that big enough. It's because he, he has the, I don't know to explain very well, but he has four stabilizers mm -hmm. and makes it steady to go, right? But you said something, the stomach has to be 
very strong because <laughs> all the foods and there was a Philippine cuisine which <laughs> was so spicy and I don't tolerate spicy. It was a very difficult. Uh, it's two and two months in the ship. Um, I was talking to the, the doctor because you gotta visit the doctor sometimes and talk some issues. And he told me something that I didn't realize it, because um, we were like in New York City with, you know, in an apartment with um, 26 nations for two months. And he had to know all the diseases of everybody on the ship that could ever possible because all the miscegenation. And I couldn't understand uh, things when I, because when I, 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 invited, I was invited in 2016 and I applied and I got, um, um, my application was succeed. I didn't realize what it was. I knew I had this dream of going, but once I was there, but I have to tell you something. The first night when I started walking through all the galleys that I didn't know nobody, mm -hmm. I had a little a panic attack. I thought, I'm going to go out. I won't be here for two months. I had a seven and eight year old girl. Mm -hmm. It took me too much for me to, but then, you know, I started talking to my roommate and she talked, she, she Without knowing, she told me her life, and it took me. I said, "Okay, okay, the ship is gonna go tomorrow, and I will go." <laughs> but it was hard. Thank you for the question. I have lots more, but I'll let other people ask. <laughs> okay, <Thank you>. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Patricia. Actually, we had um, we we were members of IODP for um, three years. Now we are trying to encourage the country to again be members of the IODP. It's not so easy, but we are doing the efforts. <laughs> um, you gotta pay, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's not so easy. <laughs> okay, if, um, I guess that if there is no more questions, mm, no, seems that not. So I would like to thank you, Patricia. Really thank you very much. And I would like to tell everybody that um, from South America, next week we go to North America. We're going to Canada. Um, so stay wow. tuned. <laughs> also marine sciences, I by will. the way. I will send you the invitation, Patricia. Okay, thank you. I will. Okay. Oh so thank you very much, okay. everybody. See you next and week. And thank you. Thank you thank very you. much for the invitation. Oh Bye, Beverly. Thank Amen. you. Uh, thank you. Uh, nice meeting you. Thank Beverly. you. It was great. And bye, Nicola. See you soon in Brazil. I hope, I hope to see you, Patricia. Obrigada. Okay, I'm waiting okay. for answers. Yeah. Okay, good. Me too. We are all, huh? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Ciao, ciao, querido. Ciao. Um beijo. Ciao. Um beijo.